Hello and welcome to this week's Spatial Spotlights. These are a series of mini webinars we do here at Carto to help you understand different parts of the spatial analysis ecosystem. So my name is Helen McKenzie and I'm here to talk to you today about gridding your data and whether hexagons are always the best hexagons for doing that. So let me just share my screen and I'll walk you through what we're going to be talking about today. So hopefully you can see that and let's just head into my slides. So yes, today we're going to be talking about whether hexagons are always the best hexagons for turning your data into a spatial grid. So if, like me, you spend all day poring over different maps, you have probably seen a bunch of maps that visualize data in the form of a hexagon grid. And maybe you've wondered, is that always the best way to do that? Why do so many people use hexagons? Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. So like I mentioned, this is a mini webinar, so we've only got 10, 15 minutes together today and we're going to be running through these three things. So first of all, why grid your data in the first place? Why transform your data into a grid? Secondly, choosing the right grid. So what is the right shape, the right size for that grid? And thirdly, we're going to have a look at a practical example for doing that. So first of all, why grid your data in the first place? So let's just talk about the two main types of spatial zones that you can have. First of all, irregular zones have data in a irregular shape, irregular size. So this is things like census tracts, output areas, uh, national boundaries, and typically a lot of data, particularly demographic data, is served in these irregular zones. So things like the census data or data from, data from the World Bank, this comes in this irregular zone in its raw data format. The second type of spatial representation we're talking about today is regular zones. So this is where shapes come in the same size, the same shape, roughly it might depend, it might differ a bit depending on latitude, but roughly the shapes and sizes are the same throughout the grid. And this has a number of advantages, which we're going to be talking about now. So there are four main reasons to grid your data, and I'm going to go through these in a little bit more detail in a second. So first of all, you can align all of your data to one common geography. Secondly, you can mitigate design bias, so flaws in the actual design of the data. Thirdly, mitigate perceptual bias, so the way that the reader understands that data when they look at it. And finally, it means that the data is often smaller, so this means it is faster to analyse and process. So let's look at those in a little bit more detail for each of them. So this is a diagram which shows pretty much all of the statistical zones that you get in the UK. If you can tell from my accent, that's where I'm based. Um, there's loads here. There's probably about 50 different zones and they all come in different shapes, different sizes, have different geo IDs. And it's really, really complicated. And it shows that data of different types is served in lots of different geographies, which can make it really difficult to analyse when it's all coming in different shapes and sizes. And this is just official geographies. So uh, private companies might serve data in different ways. Often data might come in a point format, so a postcode or zip code. So data is coming in all of these different uh, shapes and sizes and having them as a regular grid. So aggregating all of that data so it's all in one sort of common geography is a really important first step in a lot of analysis. Secondly, mitigation of design bias. So when I say design bias, I mean th the way that the irregular zones that we talked about have been designed can often have innate flaws within them. So one example of this is gerrymandering. If like me, you did a degree in GIS, then you might have come across gerrymandering in one of your first lectures to sort of illustrate uh, how data can innately have bias in it. So gerrymandering is how political parties shape statistical boundaries in countries to try and influence the results of elections. Um, so that is sort of explained on the diagram on the left. On the diagram on the right is something a little bit less nefarious. So this is showing an area in North London with population density. Um, and often uh, statistical boundaries, like this is open area, open um, output area, sorry, here in the UK. And often these boundaries are shaped by physical boundaries in the world around us. So we can see here, hopefully you can see my cursor, uh, we can see this is a park here and these lines here are main roads and you can see the boundaries are split at those main roads uh, which is fine for some use cases but say if you were working in transport and you wanted to work out what was happening along that road the fact that that road bisect is bisected by zones means that's kind of difficult to do so there's there's lots of different examples of design bias those are just two thirdly mitigation of perceptual bias so um this is related to how a lot of irregular zones and statistical zones, particularly census zones, are dictated in shape and size by 
a need to have the same population within each zone so the same population in its inner city zone as in a rural zone which means that the rural zones tend to be much much bigger um, in terms of actual geographic area so that means that when you look at a map like the one uh, in the middle here we can see that these areas on the outskirts of london have are much much bigger so your eye is typically the map is dominated by those zones whereas actually there's a lot more people living in these these darker smaller zones here so we can see what we've done here on the right is translated the output area map here in the center to a hexagon grid here on the right and it's just much easier to understand the trends in the data when you do that so that's perceptual bias and then finally, so spatial grids are typically very simple in terms of their geometry anyway. So a hexagon, for example, only has four vertices, whereas something like a census, a census tract might have hundreds or even thousands of vertices. Um, but one thing that I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail later on is uh, spatial indexes. So if you've come to one of these uh, LinkedIn lives before, you've probably heard someone from Carto talking about spatial indexes. These are basically global grid systems. Uh, so we can see the one on the right here is a hexagonal one called H3. And they're multi-resolution and they're hierarchical, so they come in lots of sort of different uh, detail levels. But what makes them really special is when they are geolocated, so placed on the Earth, unlike a traditional geometry. In fact, I've got a representation of this on the next slide. So when they are geolocated, you can see they use a really short reference string here. I think that's like 14 characters to place them on the Earth. Typically, a geometry, so something like a census tract, uses this really, really long geometry description, which is basically every coordinate pair for every vertex which makes it really quite heavy to store, whereas spatial indexes are really, really light to store. So that has all sorts of advantages around sort of storage costs and things like that, but it also means that the analysis when you're running analysis on a grid system that's a spatial index is really, really fast. And you'll see that in a bit more detail later on. So choosing the right grid, uh, are hexagons the best hexagons? So there are three shapes which you can use for a equal area, equal shape grid. Um, the reason there are three is because there's only three shapes which tessellate together, which means they fit together without any gaps between them. So you have squares, you have triangles, and you have hexagons, which is what we're all here to talk about today. So why are hexagons the restagons? So there's a few different reasons why they are such a popular shape to use for a spatial grid. First of all, the centroid of the central hexagon is the same distance to the centroid of every neighboring hexagon. Whereas if you're using a triangle or a square, that distance is gonna be different depending on the neighborhood relationship. Secondly, there's no acute angles. And you can see in this diagram, I've placed my hexagon inside a circle because part of the reason why a hexagon is so good for spatial representation is it's really similar in shape to a circle or it's much more similar than a square or a triangle. So it has that sort of soft geometry for it. It means there's no acute angles, no sort of extreme outliers within the shape. So that representation is much more <laughs> representative of every point within that shape. Uh, thirdly, all neighboring hexagons have the same spatial relationship with the central hexagon. So it's basically edge to edge each edge touches a neighboring hexagon whereas if you think about a triangle or a square sometimes it's edge to edge sometimes it's vertex to vertex and you just have those differing spatial relationships and it's also really well structured to represent geographic curves so shapes like rivers and roads that tend to be much more sort of sinuous and less perpendicular um, whereas Squares are generally really good for representing those perpendicular features because they follow those right angles themselves. Hexagons are really good for representing geographic curves. And then finally, because they have that really soft shape, they're really good at representing gradual spatial changes. But are hexagons always the best hexagons? Well, not in all cases. So if you're considering gridding your data, um, I would say think about these four things before you definitely go for hexagons. I would generally say think of hexagons almost as the default, but think about these things first in case you another grid system is more appropriate for you. So the first thing you should think about is what is the geography of what you're modeling? So I just mentioned how hexagons are really good for representing those sort of soft curving features. But if you're representing something that has horizontal lines, so say uh, particularly a city maybe in the US where you do have those very grid-like city structures, maybe actually a square uh, grid might be more appropriate because as you can see in this diagram up here on the right, sometimes, with, particularly with horizontal lines, hexagons don't represent them very well. Secondly, is your source data already in a grid? 
So for example, if your source data comes as a square grid, uh, maybe it's a raster data set, or it's something like a quad bin, then it probably isn't worth restructuring it into a hexagon just for the sake of having it as a hexagon, because you're losing that sort of integrity and you're getting further away from the source data. Um, and then similarly, if your clients or collaborators are already using a square grid or a triangle grid, then probably it's best to work in the same system as them so you're not having to constantly move between different grid types. And then finally, I feel like I can't ever do a webinar without talking about coordinate systems. I don't want to go into this in too much detail because I'll just start prattling on forever. But basically, hexagons, particularly H3, the spatial index I mentioned earlier, is mapped via a cylindrical coordinate system, which is basically a way of, coordinate systems are a way of representing spatial features on the Earth. And they all have a certain amount of bias and pros and cons to them with a projection uh, with a cylindrical coordinate system. What this basically means is the further, the higher your or lower your latitude, the more extreme latitudes, so the closer you get to the North and South Pole, the more um, con, what's the word? Uh, the more sort of uh, error there is in the hexagons, the more they're contorted around the North and South Poles. So if you are working at sort of a global scale, or if you're particularly working nearer the North or South Poles, potentially you might want to work with a um, local co uh, grid system, so maybe not a spatial index, or a spatial index like, I believe, place key is a spherical coordinate system, so it doesn't have that sort of polar uh, contortion. Um, so before I move on to a practical example, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to this ebook. So I've really briefly touched on spatial indexes today, but they're a really fantastic way of working with big spatial data, um, really at scale. And we've produced this free ebook, which you can get on the Carto website, which is a really helpful guide for getting you started with these things. We also go into a lot more detail about a lot of the things I have mentioned today. So I really recommend you head to the website and check that out. So in the final couple of minutes, I just wanted to run through an example of how you can get started with gridding your data and turning uh, your hexagons, uh, turning your data into hexagons. So let's head over to the Carto workspace. Uh, if you don't have access to Carto, you can head over to our website. We do a free two week trial for absolutely anyone and you have access to everything that I'm showing you today. So I'm just gonna head into workflows, which is our low code analytics tool. And please ignore all of the untitled workflows I have shown here. Uh, I will clean them up one day. And I'm just going to create a workflow with my connection to the Carto Data Warehouse, which if you have a Carto free trial and you don't have access to a Cloud Data Warehouse, you'll have access to this. And this has loads of demo data sets in it. So you can uh, analyze and visualize those data sets yourself. So let's just wait for that to open. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna head into sources and organize uh, demo data, sorry go into demo tables, and I'm going to find a data set to turn into a uh, hexagon grid. And I'm going to use Los Angeles Airbnb data. So let's just drag that onto the canvas. Wait for that to load. Perfect. So we've got about 18,000 Airbnbs in here. Let's just take a preview of them on the map so we know what we're working with. Great. So we have all of these Airbnbs. And if we take a look behind the data, we have things like their price, their review scores, things like that. So what we want to do is turn those into a hexagon grid. So if I head into components, these are all the analytical tools that you can use to analyze, process your data. And I need to go down to spatial indexes, uh, which is all the tools you can use to uh, convert your data into spatial indexes like H3, which is the hexagonal grid I've mentioned. So what we're going to do is use this tool called H3 from GeoPoint, connect the two, and what this will do is create a hexagon grid cell over each of our Airbnb points. Uh, so let's just, you can choose the resolution. So the bigger the number, the more detailed the resolution. So that's resolution eight. I think I'm gonna, just gonna go to nine, which I believe is about a 250 meter wide grid. Uh, so let's just run that. And then, like I said, what this will do is generate a H3 cell for each of the Airbnb points. So as this is a global grid system, sometimes a Airbnb will f there will be multiple Airbnbs in each H3 cell. So you can see here we've got 17,960 Airbnbs. If I just open that on a map, you should be able to see, great, we've created our hexagon grid, as easy as that. But what we want to do is maybe 
add a bit more intelligence to that. So I'm just going to find the group by component in here, connect the two, and then I'm going to group by the H2 index, which is that geolocation uh, variable. And then we're just going to look at the average price within each cell. And then we'll also take a look at the number of Airbnbs within each cell. Uh, so what you can do with Carto workflows is you can put all of this together and run it all in one go, or you can sort of wait, add a section, run a section, you can do whatever you want. And then you can also, like I was showing you, you can preview the data, you can preview the map, and you can also generate maps from any of these components. So let's just run that and give it a second. And what this is doing is basically aggregating those 18,000 H3 cells based on the variables I told it to. Great, so you can now see we've only got 7,000 H3 cells and we've got the average price and the count. So what I'm just going to do here is pop into map, preview and click create map. And this will generate a map in Carter Builder with that data set, uh, like so. So now we have our hexagon grid uh, ready and waiting for us and we can um, do what we want with it. We can get it styled up so we can um, maybe we want to visualize uh, the number of Airbnbs within each cell. So we can just do it like that. Maybe we want to, uh, so the default is color ramp is logarithmic. So I'll just change that to quantile. Uh, and then what you can see with spatial indexes that's really, really nifty is as you zoom in and out, the resolution changes. So you can see it at sort of appropriate level for uh, the data you're anal uh, for the zoom level you're looking at. But what you can also do is increase the resolution to uh, make it um, that bit more detailed. So that's probably a bit too detailed for this zoom level. Let's bring it out of it. Perfect. We could also maybe switch into 3D, visualize this data again by the, the count of the Airbnbs. Let's make that a bit bigger or oh, too big. Great. Uh, so that's a really, really quick walkthrough on how you can quickly transform your data into a hexagonal grid. If I just pop back into Carto workflows and take one last look down at spatial indexes, so you can see I've got all these tools for our H3 grids. So you can use that to uh, convert your data into a H3 grid, convert it back to a geometry, all of those sort of things. But we also have all these tools in here for Quadbin, which is a very similar approach, but unlike hexagons, this data is in a square. So if you decided that hexagons weren't the best hexagons for your workflow and your use case, then maybe you can use these tools in the exact same way that I just showed you. Uh, so I believe that is everything for me. Thank you so much for coming along to, uh, to my mini webinar today. I hope you found it useful. I certainly enjoyed talking about hexagons. If you have been coming to the spatial, in, uh, the spatial spotlights every week, uh, you might notice we don't have one next week. That's because at Carto, we are all hands on deck for the Spatial Data Science Conference in New York next week. So we are off next week, but back the week after. So hopefully we will see you there. Thank you so much for coming again. Bye.